Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of the Africa is Home Global Podcast. You guys know how we do it every weekend. We come here and we bring the brilliant and most innovative minds from Africa to help our people progress. So joining us today directly from Maryland is our brother, Mr. Stephen. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us today. It's my pleasure, sir. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, our topic of discussion today is going to be the relationship between Africans in Africa and Africans in the diasporas. And this also include African-Americans, African-Europeans, and the, our fellow Black people in the Caribbean. All right, Mr. Stephen, let's dive right into it <laughs> once more. Thank you so much for joining me today. Once so, again, sir. <laughs> all right, welcome. All right, so when you look at um, this relationship and how we interact, uh, be, be, uh, when you look at the relationship between Africans living in Africa, let me rephrase that, and the Africans in the diasporas, what do you think about the way we interact with one another? Uh, first of all, I want to say a very big thank you to you and your team for having me uh, on your podcast. And for anyone who is watching, my name is Steven Selassie. So thank I'm you from so Ghana, the West yeah. Africa, the Af West African coast of Africa. And um, being on such a platform to talk I was inspired by a number of key things. One, how to tell our story as Africans better. Two, how to promote indigenous success stories of Africa. Three, how to connect other Africans to see the beauty of the continent and uphold our identity. Four, was to attract other people who are not African at all to believe, trust, and celebrate what Africa is to the world. And number five, is to ensure that the world respects Africa, invest in Africa, and and see us for who we truly are and respect us as such. And over the years, this has made me to work in the civic, uh, civic uh, society, as well as I work in the public sector, and I'm working in the pri uh, private sector as well, all in a bit to see how best we could bring in stakeholders, either from the government level or from the private sector or from civil society to contribute to achieving this holistic mandate. Um, coming back to your question, which is, what do I see the relation between Africa and this diaspora? I think it's, it's still a green area. Okay. Basically, it, it's over the past, it has been more of symbiotic, or I'll call it more parasitical, because once um, Platini is in the US, and I know I'm his younger brother, all mm -hmm. my requests of need go towards Platini. Like, hey, Platini, you know, my school fees is, is, uh, is due. Can you send mm -hmm. me um hundred dollars? Can you send me two hundred dollars? It's be more more or less like that. So people, first generation uh, Africans in the diaspora, or people who are of Africa um, directly from Africa who are immigrants out there, get yeah. to face this. Uh, it's not been a relationship of what can we do next. It's been more of send me, send me, send me. Then we have the um, historical uh, Africans or historical diaspora, who mm -hmm. by other means of uh, the uh, transatlantic slave trade had mm -hmm. to leave the coast, or people who migrated centuries ahead because they were powerful enough to, to migrate to other parts of the world. Mind you, a lot of people think Africans in the diaspora are all either immigrants or were sent there by slave trade. It's not the, it's not the picture. They were, there's, history tells us very well that they were powerful Africans Mm -hmm. who migrated to other parts of the world in, in quest to expand their territories. So when we come to those category of people of African descent, it's mm -hmm. always been about, um, one, the, the pain of slave trade, especially because we realize that our stories are mostly around the slave trade, the mm -hmm. transatlantic slave trade. So we forget mostly about the other categories of African, but focusing on these categories, you realize it's been more of repairing the hurt and the pain of the slave trade. Mm -hmm. So some of them, when they hear about Africa or they see an African, they remember the slave trade. So 
these are the various categories, but it's been so far so good. We the change of the narrative. There's a changing um, narrative. There's a paradigm shift from the pain narrative, from the dependency narrative, mm-hmm. and from the uh, the narrative of always looking at as Africa as a tourism attraction or a tourist attraction or a tourist site. Mm-hmm. Now, um, I'll look back in 2019 when we had the 400 years um, of the cancellation of slave trade celebrated by Ghana with the Year of Return initiative. Mm-hmm. It started a whole new paradigm uh, shift. Way back 20, 30 years ago, there was what we call the Pana Fest in Ghana, which opened opportunity for people from the diaspora, specifically from the Caribbean, to come back home. But this Year of Return initiative in 2019, Mm-hmm. Open a new gate. So you realize there were a lot of people, celebrities from the United States, uh, from mm-hmm. America in general, trooping in their numbers to, to Ghana or to Africa. And I mean, the government of Ghana played a key role in that because it was sold so far to the diaspora that, hey, it's time to come back home, um, come back home because it's an opportunity for you to settle down. And they also opened the opportunity for people of African descent to settle home and become citizens. Oh, so wow. now the relationship moved from just them being tourists, coming back to see how the slave trade happened, what mm-hmm. Africa looks like, just uh, or just a tourism um, trip to now settling down. So now I think the African Union and some of these member states are looking forward to now build a relationship beyond tourism um, or connection by historical um, um uh, evidence of the past to making Africa, uh, people of African descent, look at Africa as a home. Opportunities are being open to them to settle in as citizens. And the African Union has taken a step forward to name the diaspora or the African diaspora the sixth region of um, Africa. So we have West Africa, mm-hmm. Central Africa, East Africa, Southern Africa, Northern Africa, and we have the diaspora Africa as a sixth region. So I think the relationship is getting better and I think much more can be done. Oh, great. Uh, to follow up on uh, this event that was done back in 2019, I read an article that stated that uh, the president of Ghana gave uh, our brothers and sisters that came back to Africa, specifically to Ghana, a lot of hectares of land to, to settle on. Are they doing anything with the land so far or is it still just back in? No, uh, a lot is happening. Uh, I can I can tell you, uh, I wish I had all the facts. I'm very sure in subsequent podcasts, I'll be able to provide you facts from the government. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a lot of African-Americans just um, this past week. A yeah. number of them were made citizens. Some of them are businessmen. Some of them are into real estate. They are mm-hmm. looking forward to settle. So, so far, a lot of the diasporans are establishing businesses. Mm-hmm. They are also building homes. Some of them are even venturing into real estate so that they could build um, choice um, apartments or buildings that suit the taste of African-Americans back home. So a lot is going on. Um, uh, just last, two, uh, about 10 days ago, there was a ceremony here in Washington, D.C., where yeah. the government of Ghana granted citizenship to some more um, African-Americans uh, who were interested in becoming African. So I think a lot is going on. And even though there's much to be done, and that's why we we having engagements like this to attract more um, sensitive, critical, and more impact making um, utilization of opportunities like that. Great. Well, congratulations to Ghana so much for taking the first step uh, in, towards towards this direction. And uh, we'd like to encourage a lot of African countries to follow up in Ghana's full step so that we can welcome them not only in, in in Western Africa but all over Africa. Exactly. All right. Uh, my next question to you, is, uh, Mr. Stephen, is when you look at um, there's, there's been a long term argument between African-Americans and then Africans in Europe and in the Caribbean due to like slight cultural differences and slight differences in our history. That, that there's this big argument that they are not with us. They are not part of us. So what, what are your thoughts on that? Because when they say African-Americans, some of them go like, no, we are not African-Americans. We are Americans. We don't have anything to do with Africa. And then there's a lot of us back home too that look at them like, oh, these are not our brothers and sisters. Yeah, the way they act, the way they do their things is very different from us. We don't want to associate with them. What are your thoughts on this? 
unfortunately, a tree that does not recognize its roots is doomed. Okay. And you can imagine a tree <laughs> that has roots that don't recognize its branches is also doomed. That's what is happening to Africa. When you critically study the Jewish people, yeah, I have a lot of respect for the Jews because they understand their roots. Even though many about a century plus ago, um, before the 1945 or the 1940s, there was no state of Israel. Mm -hmm. But there were Jewish people who upheld their cultural beliefs mm -hmm. all over the world, in South America, in America, and in Northern America, and even in Europe. Even mm -hmm. though they were scattered across the world, they held on to their cultural values for many centuries, more than 400 years similar to the story of Africa. So you realize that they, they believed, they still had their cultural beliefs, they still had their religious beliefs, and they still had their economic beliefs. So much that when they decided that they were going back to where was their former home, which they were exiled from, it was very easy for them to resettle in and still become one of the most powerful countries in the world. Today, Israelites control almost all industries in the world, from media to film industry, to technology, to agriculture, mm -hmm. keep naming them. They have influence in almost, when it comes to defense, they are top-notch. When it comes to every industry in the world, they are the top. Why? They are because, very creative. Because they've held, the key thing is they've held onto their cultural identity. And this is what Africans have lost. So you see an African, someone who is as black as me, who says they don't have anything to do with Africa. That's very strange. Even Chinese and Indians, as prosperous as they are, wherever they find themselves, they do not forget their roots. They never. That, and that has been the problem of Africa. One, because we've forgotten our cultural beliefs as a people of African descent, so we don't have any identity. So it's strange to see that an African from uh, whose um, um, maybe grandparents settled in the U.S. and gave birth to them, yeah, I don't have anything to do with Africa or someone who by um, cultural or uh, by historical accident were sent to the US or to any part in Americas and down the line, 400 years down the line, they say they don't have anything to do with Africa. You will not hear Jewish people talk like that. They believe that they belong to Israel and that is their root. So everything they do, everything they achieve, they accrue it back to their cultural identity. And I think that's what people of African descent need to do. And I believe that a lot of people are, are weakness and awakening. There's a, there's a very unconscious awakening that is happening, that is bringing awareness to people. Even though we get to hear a lot of this, sometimes very disappointing to hear, but I think gradually with platforms like this, we'll get mm -hmm. to educate ourselves that there is no person of African descent without Africa. Africa is the root of every black man in the world. And we need to respect it. We need to believe in it. And we need to build that image and that cultural identity that makes us stand out. There is no continent like Africa, I'll tell you. When you go to Europe, there are differences in culture. Mm -hmm. Realize it. There are different uh, groups of people. When you go to Asia, the same. When you come to America, it's a little divergent because of the mix of the indigenous people. But Africa is that one continent where you have people who have a larger um, area, especially in South Saharan Africa, who have simil similarities in many ways in our culture, in our, in our food, our clothing. Even in our languages, there are words that, that, across, across, uh, that cut across different yeah. tribes that you can mm -hmm. have in between. So you realize we are so unique. The earlier we begin to understand that we are one people and build on it, the better for us. Yeah, you're right. And uh, another thing, too, we need to consider when we're looking at uh, how uh, most of our brothers and sisters out here, how they reject us is they, we get treated so poorly because we have not built our home, which is Africa. Yes. You will never see a Jewish person anywhere in the world get disrespected the way Africans do and the way the black man do. Yeah. You will never see a French person go through that. Why? Because France itself, their home is beautiful. It's powerful. And we have all the resources to do this in Africa. So we must look back home. I don't care if you're African-American or African that was born in the Caribbean. So if you've never been to Africa, as far as you 
have this melanin on your body. Africa is home to you. And we must together collectively build it. All right, thank you so much for, for, for diving in, into details with this uh, with that question for me. All right, when you look at how we have migrated, so many Africans have left Africa, so many of us over the years. So much that we, we uh, I think it was a study that was done in 2007. No, it was published in 2017, but it, it, it tracked back many years back. It, it stated that uh, we have sent uh, a racking sum of four, uh, $401 billion dollars back home, which this money is vital for the development of Africa. But when you look 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 back home, it not much has been done. So what can we do to secure our investments back home and make sure that the money we send back home actually goes into helping advance our economy? That's a very critical question. That's one of the things that my organization is seeking to do, especially with governments and uh, private uh, sector mm -hmm. players. Mm -hmm. as well as a civic society i think i believe these three category of uh, uh, this three category of um, uh, attention uh, mm -hmm. needs to be looked at when we have to discuss this issue okay. um, i think that remittances from the diaspora to the continent have played a key role when it comes to development of our continent trust me the development quotient per private sector to government in Africa, mm -hmm. I think a lot goes to the private sector. Look at the houses we have uh, or real estates we have in Africa, largely mm -hmm. built by pri the private sector. Mm -hmm. Look at um, some of the um, social amenities we have, largely um, invested or built by the private sector. Mm -hmm. When we look at the livelihood, the businesses, you realize that Majority of them are by the private sector. And I can dare say that most of these businesses and social amenities were built by people from the diaspora. Mm -hmm. So I think that there has been a chunk of our development in Africa that has been inspired by the diaspora. The problem is we don't have, most countries don't have a diaspora policy. Because we do not see the diaspora, we, we keep focusing on foreign aid and loans, we do not see the investment from the diaspora as the key to the development of our various states, our sovereign states on the African um, continent. Mm -hmm. So I think that one of the key things that has to be done by um, Africans is ensuring that our governments have a diaspora development policy. Yeah. With this policy, it will be able to streamline one invest, investment portfolio from the diaspora where if we are not just focusing on them sending money uh, as remittances just for yeah. things to be done to take care of welfare of their families or to build something for them or put to something or send some cars back home and all but it goes specifically into a development or an investment portfolio that drives national development for example in ghana uh, the Ghana Investment Promotion Center, which handles investment, has a current drive where they are looking forward to pull in investment from the diaspora directly. I believe the other 54 African states, as much as we are promoting the African continental free trade area, we need to have an investment policy for the diaspora, which is very specific, uh, very specific, excuse me, towards investing into development, investing into uh, the private sector or into businesses to develop. Number two, we'll be looking at the diaspora as a human resource capital to the continent. Africa will never be a par with the rest of the world if we don't look at the diaspora as Africa's human resource capital base. Mm -hmm. When we look at the people who are in the diaspora, from the medical field to the educational field to uh, the financial sector, to technology, to real estate, mention all the industries. You realize Africans are top notch, top 10, high level, top level in every industry from sports to what, name it, movies, entertainment, Africans are there, or people of African descent are there. African governments need to look at special exchange programs that can be embarked on to ensure that the doctor from, from Cameroon. Mm -hmm. And exchange knowledge with a doctor 
of African descent from the United States or from, from Europe or from any part of the world. So as to ensure that what we lack in our um, skills development of our continent can be quickly jumped up by a decade, a century above because of the knowledge you pull from the diaspora. And I can assure you, Africa will, will actually achieve its goal of swift development that will make sure that Africa becomes a home for people of African descent across the world and they'll be very proud of. All right, great. Um, when you look at our uh, immigration, some of us, a lot of us have migrated out of Africa over the years, mm -hmm. so many. And a greater percentage of that, of, of those that have migrated, is not going back home. They are not even investing back in Africa. They just left and just closed the African chapter for good. Yeah. What 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 do you think we can do to bring them back home? Because they have learned so many things and they are they are so creative yes. that our economies back in Africa really they need are building the really... countries in which they are. They are contributing so much to the countries in which yeah. they, they they have settled. The problem here is when you you drive here in the US, right? Yeah, I do. <laughs> When you go back home, look at how chaotic our traffic systems are. Mm, mm. <laughs> so looking at it that way, the, the comfortabilities you have, the systems that exist, take for example, in the United States, do not exist back home. Why would you go back home? You are never looking forward to bringing your family all the way back to where you are so that you can all settle and then forget about that place. Because because of the lack of systems, because of the lack of order and the rapid development we wish to see, a lot of people are disinterested in, in going back to Africa. But I think that that's where, unfortunately, it comes back to leadership. I've been very critical, and that's why I'm happy that um, one way or the other, the United States government introduced a program like the YALE program, which is the Young African Leaders Initiative, which is one of the many leadership um, exchange programs the United States has offered Africans. As to how we are strategically using it to develop our leadership base is another thing. Mm -hmm. But I believe that these are some of the leadership um, programs that we need. I want to see people of African descent building a lot of leadership programs that will grow the kind of leaders who have the mind of the African globally to mm -hmm. develop their continent. A lot of African leaders we see today are thinking about their family and themselves only. So we realize yeah. that the passion to create systems that are powered with globalization do not exist. The, the infrastructure that makes America, America does not exist in Africa. There is a system that ensures that every road is motorable for users in the United States. Is that the same in Africa? No, it's rather a political campaign message by a party that will come and say, oh, I'll change all roads. You know, I'll make sure all roads are, are global, are of global standard. But it's not supposed to be so. There must be a road authority that handles roads. There must be a health authority that handles health. So the politician does not have any means to manipulate it. They just come in to ensure they build the policies. But there's an implementative authority for every sector to ensure that it's working on autopilot. Unfortunately, that's not the case. So I think that the development of systems mm -hmm. is very critical. And that's where you and I have a role to play. We cannot relinquish the development of Africa and its systems to only politicians. It's not going to work. We've had independence. Well, Ghana just celebrated 66 years of independence. Ghana being the uh, oldest democracy that came out of um, uh, how they call it, colonialism. Yeah. Of course, there'll be the uh, Liberia and uh, um and Ethiopia have not been colonized, but if we look at Ghana as mm -hmm. a benchmark for coming out of colonialism, Africa's development or democracy or governance started 66 years ago. What has been the successes that we've built so far, apart from having elections and elections and elections? <laughs> we need to inspire. This not ha doesn't have to be aggressive demonstrations on the street, but it has to be dialogues dialogues, dialogues, with timelines and targets given to our politicians to look at building systems. Africans don't want so much from their governments. They just want running water, electricity, affordable accommodation, roads to travel on, 
and the amenities, and that's all. You don't want anything from them. Unfortunately, they don't focus on those things. They focus on the wrong things, and they spend too much money, and Africa is in debt. I think that the diaspora has a key role to play. We need to look at the system that exists here mm -hmm. and, and bring the mind of our leaders onto the same levels. How can we help them to build systems? Where we can bring in our skills, human resource, we should. We should help them. We should stand on them. They listen a lot to people who travel from our side. Our leaders listen a lot to them. We should use the advantage to direct them in a way that systems can be built over the next 10 years, especially in this uh, decade of action for the sustainable development goals. I think we can do something. Civil society organizations, NGOs, and private sector players who are the top or captains of their industry have a role to play. Let's hold our African governors, uh, governments and their institutions accountable. Let's engage them in a very strategic manner. No need to accuse them of being doing wrong. I think it's not going to work. We've done that for many years. We still not gotten results. We should engage roundtable discussions where we can discuss industry by industry and bring their minds onto what we expect from them and help them to achieve it. I think over the next decade or two, if we do that strategically, we can be able to build a home uh, for ourselves so that we can be proud to go back home to the, the continent of Africa. You're right. We need where accountability is very much needed within the African government. We really need that. And someone has to step up and start holding our government accountable. And we need structure back home. But here's a problem, though. If we all leave Africa and nobody is willing to go back to help build this, this will never, we will never get to that point. Exactly. Yeah. Because even when you look at the United States of America, where everybody wants to go so, so much, the West, Europe, they did not just get here. They actually yeah. worked very hard. There were times when the economy was not good. We all have read about sure. the wars that we have fought over here to get to where they are today. Sure. We have not gone through much revolution in Africa. Sure. Yeah. So we have to be able to put in the work to get there instead of just taking our families out and running away. That would never solve our problem. When you step out here, you see and you go like, okay, this thing that was happening back in my country was definitely wrong. I was too blind to see it then. Now I see it now. It's for you to step up like you're doing now like I am doing, all of us collectively have to come together, step up, and then better up Africa. Sure. Yeah, with the help of our diaspora brothers that are of African descent but have never been to Africa. Yeah, that is how we have to go about it. So thank you so much, uh, Mr. Stephen. So you are the current president of, of BDIC. I hope I'm, 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 I'm re re reading the acronym right. So <laughs> please, what does it stand for? What does it stand for? <laughs> okay, so B I D E C Bidek or Bidek or whatever. Okay, Bidek. Okay, or, there we go. <laughs> um, is stands for the Bureau for International Development, mm -hmm. Exchanges, and Commerce. So, as our name sounds, we are a center that's interested in uh, bringing information and mm -hmm. details and opportunities on how Africa's diaspora can invest into sustainable development initiatives on the continent mm -hmm. and participate or partake in cultural um, skills mm -hmm. uh, and um, educational exchange programs on the continent. Mm -hmm. And last but not the least, anything that has to do with commerce. So trade, missions, expos, um, investment, engagements, um, free zones, opportunities, PBOs, anything that has to do with trade. So. Our organization is basically a center that is interested in ensuring that we, we, we collaborate with the diaspora and the African continent when it comes to the public sector, the private sector, and the civic um, and society to ensure that we spare uh, rapid development on the continent. And we are currently based in Accra, Ghana, and we are looking forward to, uh, we have representatives in Europe, in America, and we are looking forward to, and in Asia as well, we are looking forward to establish satellite um, offices on this continent. And of course, we are looking forward over the next three years to build our headquarters here in the US because of the economic um, role that US plays in global, um, in global politics. So uh, we're looking forward to working with institutions, partnerships with institutions, mm -hmm. uh, partnership with governments on the continent to have platforms that create relevance for the African diaspora, both internationally and back home on the continent. 
Great, 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 great. My next question was going to be if you are interested in partnership, but you already covered that. So yeah, that is really good that, that uh, you're interested in that. Are you also looking for like investors into your projects? Yes, certainly. Um, recently, uh, in the month of February, we had the Black History Festival in Columbus, Ohio, and we are looking forward to going back there. We had a first edition in, in Washington, D.C. We launched it in Washington, D.C. in 2022, and we had the last edition in February in Columbus. We're looking forward to go back there in 2024 because we want to consolidate our, our gains in, that, in the Midlands. So we have um, expos, uh, we have conferences, and we have uh, development initiatives. Yes, we are very interested. We are establishing networks for um, diaspora investors. And as a result of that, we've started partnerships with organizations like the One Voice um, Consortium, which mm -hmm. is largely East African-based uh, diasporans here in the US who are also seeking to do the same thing. We believe that we as an organization alone cannot achieve any goal um, sustainably or on a large impact base. It is about sharing the same view or partnering with organizations that have the same views and the same mandate so that we can have a colosseum or an alliance of a large magnitude that can make the bank kind of impact, mm -hmm. the boom kind of impact, so that our impact is not scattered all over the place. I come and say, I'm doing this. I come and say, I'm doing this. It's not going to work. We're looking forward to be a catalyst towards building an alliance, towards the mandate of the speedy development of Africa, the collective, um, uh, the collective investment portfolio of the diaspora, and the collective um, amalgamation of the human resource, the rich human resource or capital of the diaspora to ensure that over the next decade, we should mm -hmm. be able to quantify our achievements so much has been done when it comes to diaspora engagement, but can we as people of African descent really celebrate it? So we are very interested in investment in the area of partnership with other like-minded organizations, uh, investment, building our investment groups where we have people of African descent who want to invest in businesses in Africa or initiatives mm -hmm. in Africa, and then also working with other people who want to either sponsor or invest into our existing programs like the Black History Festival, our Diaspora Network Conference that will happen in September in New York and other programs. So yes, we are interested in working with uh, investors who want to work uh, on these uh, various mandates of ours. Great. Viewers, you guys heard it from Mr. Stephen. He's looking for investors and possible partnerships. So uh, Mr. Stephen, what are your social media handles? That is something a lot of people would want to check. <laughs> So um, currently we, we're undergoing a lot of development, but if you hear this podcast maybe a month from now, two months mm -hmm. from now, you go on Facebook, if you go on Twitter, you go on mm -hmm. LinkedIn, you go on every social media platform, you just look for BIDC or BIDEC uh, for short. Okay. BIDEC for short, you'll be able to reach us. Then, of course, you go to our website. We have, uh, go to www. Uh, that has BIDEC, B I D E C online mm -hmm. dot com. B I D E C online dot com. You can reach us. And one of our most uh, popular platforms is the Black History Festival platform. Uh, so, Black History is more like our, our marketplace. So, if you oh. go to www dot Black History Festivals, if an S dot com, you can reach us or you go. All social media platforms you can reach us on. You can when you type the Black History Festivals, you can reach us there. And we are excited to work with you. If you want to send us an email as mm -hmm. well, you could just send us an email at info at b i d e c um, online dot com, mm -hmm. or you can also send us an email on our Gmail account as info dot b i d c at gmail dot com. You can reach us. And we will be very glad to, to engage with you. Our contact number here in the US is also 240-889-0123. Um, uh, 240-889-0134. Uh, um, uh, we also have other local numbers in Africa that if you are interested in reaching us, you could just hit us on WhatsApp. Um, plus, that's 233 Mm -hmm. 244 
082-718-0182-782-718 on WhatsApp, and you can reach us, and we'll be very glad to engage with you. This is great. All right, you mentioned, uh, did you say uh, Black Black History Festival? Yes. What is that like a subsection under, under this organization? Yes, it's one of our, our initiatives. So the Black History Festival, we call it, is our marketplace. So every year in February, we have the Black History Festival to bring in people of African descent all over the world to celebrate our rich history. So we're looking forward to ensuring it becomes one of those landmark or milestone events where people of African descent, especially in America's come here. So currently we have the Black History Festival USA that happens in February, and we have the Black History Festival Europe that happens in October, and we have the Black History Homecoming which happens in Africa. So this year we'll be having the Ghana, and uh, we'll be having the African edition in Ghana. We mm -hmm. are looking forward to go to Senegal next year and then probably Cameroon the next and then probably Morocco the next. So it will be shifting from one country to the other. And the US edition also moves from one, uh, one state to another. But the 2024 edition will go back to Columbus because we want to make sure that we really consolidate what we achieved there. So, Basically, the Black History Festival is our marketplace. Great, 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 man. I mean, and okay, this is a personal question for me. So did you start this organization? Yeah, I, I'm privileged to work with other people, but I'm the founder of this organization. It, it all stemmed up from my engagement as a Yale fellow, getting mm -hmm. to meet other young Africans from the continent. I realized that we have so much to offer. And I was privileged to lead uh, in the establishment of Yali TV, which worked directly under the State Department and our embassy, the U.S. embassy locally in, in Ghana. And then from there, we met more people and realized there was more to do. Um, inspiration from people like um, Papso, who happened to be um, a Senegalese um, official that works with the U.S. government, who is now with ECOWAS, uh, Tony Elumelu. Mm -hmm. And we've gained like, personalities like the president of Ghana, if what is doing with the diaspora, we realize that the diaspora is the next big thing for Africa. So we established um, in partnership with some other Yale fellows, we established the uh, BIDEC or the Bureau for International Development, Exchanges and Commerce. And here we are. Yeah, that was a very smart initiative from you. So I know definitely before you get to this great, before you get, get to do great things like this, there's always something that inspires you. There's always something that catalyzes the entire reaction before it starts. So what was that catalytic factor? What inspired you to create this? Um, It's all about us. As I started, is the wealth of experience I witnessed in the Yale program. Wow. Of course, it started with my relationship with way back about, I was looking back at that about 13, 14 years ago, where I happened to have friends who were from Gabon and some other uh, um, African um, neighbors who were my friends. Mm -hmm. The relationship we had culturally, getting to speak French because I became their friend so much that people thought I was from Kukua at the point. Mm -hmm. And to be a participant of this leadership program or this exchange program gave me a perspective of Africa. I think we are sitting on the beauty of Africa. And I realized the beauty of Africa is not our safaris, it's not the wildlife we see, uh, it's not even our minerals that we mine from the soil, but it's the people. The people of Africa actually are the richest resources the continent has ever had. Look how unique we are, our creativity our display of strength, our rich culture when it comes to our food, our clothing, and our languages. A lot of people ignore how beautiful our languages are. These are so inspirational. Where you hear somebody say something, the, the, the way they even move their tongue alone, it's an attraction <laughs> for people to come and sit down and listen. But unfortunately, we, we so forget how rich Africa is, and we look at everywhere else apart from Africa. And this has been my inspiration. Anytime I, I travel out of the continent, I see how well resources have been utilized. In fact, most of these resources come from Africa. Trust me, France has been built on Africa's resources. Absolutely. The United Absolutely. Kingdom was built on resources of Africa. Absolutely. The United States was built on the resources of Africa. Absolutely. China is being built on the resources of Africa, but Africans are not building nothing with the resources that come from the continent. It makes me cry. 
I cried deep within. And one of the things that strangely inspired me is the national anthem of Ghana. It, it says as such, God bless our homeland Ghana and I equate it to Africa and make our nation, our continent great and strong. Bold to defend forever the cause of freedom and of right. Build our hearts with true humility. You know, make us fearless and honesty and help us to resist our presence rule with all our will and might forevermore. This is a prayer that was endorsed by the first president um, of Ghana, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. Kwame Nkrumah. I believe this was one of my experiences. Anytime I hear this anthem, it is a clarion call to me as a Ghanaian and an African, and I believe it should be the clarion call to every African. We have to be bold to defend forever the cause of our freedom and our rights. And our economic rights now stand store in all. The African, the average African cannot boast of having a thousand dollars sitting in the account. Nah. That's a thousand dollars. The African today, economically, cannot be equated to a thousand dollars. We are all, the whole continent is in negative because of the huge debts we have. Our debt is not even the problem, it's how we see it. You have resources and you have a debt. Our resources are way more than our debt, but we have been made to see economically because well, the world is a competition. It's a competition, it's a competitive field. Europeans are not coming to make Africans their overlords. Neither will the Chinese or the Asians do that. Americans are not going to do that. They'll always make you know that um, we have more than you. And it is economic sense. I mean, this is a battle for a global economics. So the earlier Africans get to recalculate, calibrate our mind and renew our mind, the earlier, the better. All the blessings God has given Africa will never come to reality if we don't renew our mind. We need to see ourselves as the world saviors, which we are. When it comes to our Greek and food security, Africa in the next decade or two is going to be the food basket of the world. We have been, but now where global um, economics is going, climate change and all, Mm -hmm. Africa is the only or largely arable land right now in the world. We are going to be the food basket of the world. What impact or steps are we taking to ensure that we are the ones who own this food basket? Because the Europeans are coming to Africa. They are coming back. We are yeah. running to Europe. They, they are, are coming, coming to the continent. Yeah, they are coming back. We are running to America. They are coming here. Absolutely. They are coming the back. The largest investors in our energy sector are mostly Europeans or specifically Americans. But we don't have any role we are playing. Very soon we are going to lose our, our agricultural uh, um, prowess because the Chinese are buying our lands, the Americans are buying our lands, the Europeans are buying our lands. I was in a meeting where uh, the Netherlands parliament mm -hmm. are having discussions on how to invest into innovation in agriculture on the continent. Do you know what that means? That's, it that... means they will raise. <laughs> they are Mr. going to Steven. raise. That's a new scramble for Africa. That's exactly. another scramble for Africa right now. But this time around is is the economic scramble for Africa, and we're exactly. sitting again on the sideline watching. Exactly. So, many years down sad. the line. This is my motivation because if we don't do anything, one day, just like this in the conversation, our children are going to ask us, "Daddy, I know you're so intelligent. What did you do? What did, what did you do? <laughs> what did you do?" And you realize with all your gray hairs and probably you park a lot of cars in your company and you think you are a rich man, you've done nothing. You did nothing. So this is an opportunity, a clarion call to every person of African descent. I, I wish I could mention the word black because sometimes when you mention black, it looks as though you are being racist, but trust me, the, the, the easy identity of a person of African descent is our color. Of course, we have um, other Africans who are, are colored, as I'll say, mm -hmm. but this is a call for us. If we don't make Africa great, we are going to regret it. And the regret of the past will not even be much the regret of the future, which is coming. And the earlier we come together to ensure that we build a strong economic base for the continent so that anytime we come to the continent, we are proud. I'm not saying every African should relocate to Africa. Yes, stay in America, stay yeah. in Europe, stay in, uh, in Asia or South America, but make sure in your little way, 
you contribute to the speedy development of the continent so much that we should have a place we call home when we want to rest. Mm. Thank you so much, Mr. Stephen. Thank you. I hope they, they, they listen to these wise words and act on because, again, the new scramble for Africa is right now. Before right you know now. it, the whole of Africa is going to be industrialized again. The whole of Africa is going to be industrialized and we will not even have a say in it. Like, for example, we, we have a case study of in, in South Africa. The great Mandela fought a good fight, but he fought for the for the political power, but he never really took the economy back from exactly. foreigners. And now we see what is happening. We're getting all of this uh, uh, xenophobic anger, yeah. xenophobic anger in the streets of South Africa, killing our own brothers right. that are coming there in search of greener pastures. All yeah. of this is because they don't have control of their economy. Yeah, before we get to all talking about politics and all why not, we need to be able to control our own resources first. And the Europeans are coming back. Americans are coming back. Look at Russia, trying so much to partner with South Africa. They are they are coming back again. So we yeah. must make sure that we are ready this time. Yes, sure. Of course, we will not. It's it's uh, sitting and saying that Africa for Africans alone is a little bit uh, not very smart. Yes, mm -hmm. because we need the missionaries, we need the infrastructures to help develop our sure. continent. But let us sit on equal partnerships on the table this time around. Yes, we'll sir. just hand it to them. Yeah. So yeah, that would that would be it for the questions that I have for you today. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast, and I hope that we we can partner, do so much work for Africa, and uh, As to, we. to bring you back here to check on the progress of uh Bidik. <laughs> <laughs> I got it right. So yeah, thank you yeah. so much, Mister Stephen. You have a wonderful rest of your day, and uh, again, we appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.